Well, good morning, everybody. How are you today? Doing good? So I'm super excited about this series. We're starting next weekend, and it'll be a great series to invite some people to because all of us deal with relationship issues all of our lives, and whether we like it or not, uh, we are the product of our families of origin in good ways and bad ways, and that impacts relationships and dating and marriage and family uh, for the rest of our lives. You know, this is us. This is our story, and all. I'll make you this promise. You give us the next four weekends, we're gonna share with you practical wisdom from God's word to genuinely help you in this area of your life. And uh, I wanna get started today by asking you to help me welcome all of our Eastside family joining us in Eastside, La Habra, Park Rapids, Bellflower, online. We love doing this together. And uh, I'm stoked about the Changemaker celebration coming up because I get to visit every campus uh, personally and celebrate our change makers. So we're gonna be here in uh, Anaheim uh, this Wednesday night. And then uh, all you folks in La Habra, look, I'm coming your way next Sunday, 4.30, and everybody in Bellflower the following Wednesday, May 9th, and then all the way up to the great Northland in the frozen tundra of Minnesota, I'm coming your way on uh, May 16th. They still had 28 inches of ice on the lake this week. So uh, tells you what it's like up that way. So if you're just joining us, uh, we're wrapping up today. It's the finale of our series, You Asked For It. And uh, the way that this series formed was several months ago, uh, we put out a survey. We asked thousands of people, if you could ask God anything, uh, what would you ask him? And so we've, we've tabulated the results and have been counting down the top eight questions. And I don't know if it's just because you guys like to see your pastor sweat, if you like to inflict cruel and unusual punishment on me, but you have asked some doozies over the last eight weeks, uh, four weeks, and this week is no exception. And we're gonna wrap up the series with your top two questions. One uh, didn't surprise me at all that you asked. The other one did surprise me a little bit that it was within your top two. Now here's the first question we're dealing with today. Why do bad things happen to good people? Because let's be honest, if, if we were God, bad things would only happen to bad people and good things would always happen to good people. One of my favorite uh, stories that I found in the news a few years ago was uh, based about a woman named Vera Chermak from Prague, Czechoslovakia, who'd found out that her husband was having an affair and she was devastated and she was in despair and not knowing what to do, she thought about murdering her husband and then in her darkness of soul, she thought about taking her own life and committing suicide, which she attempted to do by jumping out of her third story apartment window. But inadvertently, not knowing this would happen, she landed on her husband who was walking on the street below, <laughs> killing him and she only experienced minor injuries. <laughs> Don't you love that? I mean. That's the way it would be if we were in charge of the world. Somebody does something bad, they get struck by lightning or at least by a flying Czech woman, right? <laughs> and if we were God, only good things would happen to good people, especially us. Good kids would always get straight A's. Faithful spouses would always have fairy tale marriages. Good parents would never get cancer. Couples who want to have children would always have them. Three at a time, they would have them. For every drop of rain that fell, a flower would grow. I mean, that's how it would be if we were God. So why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? It'd be so much easier today if this discussion, so much more innocuous, if this discussion was at a academic level or just a philosophical level. But for most of us, this is a discussion that hits us at a very personal level. I mean, we know what it is to experience, you know, that feeling in our gut of suffering and pain and tragedy in our world. Let me just read to you some of the things people wrote on our survey. Somebody wrote, why does God allow mass shootings like Las Vegas to happen and allow innocent people to die? I am a survivor of the Las Vegas shooting and can't come to understand. Someone asked, why do children suffer and why does God allow them to suffer in their innocence? Another, why do good people have to die so early? Why did my parents have to get a divorce? Why do miscarriages and death 
happen to innocent children? Why are people tortured with mental illness? Why did child abuse happen in the home where I should have been loved and protected? Bad things in this world take on a completely different dimension when it's my pain, my spouse, my child, my marriage, my health, my life. Well, first, I want you to know today, God doesn't cause bad things to happen. Lamentations in the Old Testament, chapter 3, is one example where it says, God does not willingly bring affliction or grief to the children of men. That's not God. God wants the utmost good for people. So if that's what he wants, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? Let me encourage you, if this is a subject that's of interest to you, to take a few notes of some of the things that I'm about to share. First, some of the bad things that happen in our life happen as a result of our own sin. If I cheat on my spouse, it's not a mystery as to my spouse wanting a divorce. If I drink too much, if I eat the wrong food, it's not a mystery if I have health problems. Some bad things are just the result of my own sin, but not most of it. Some bad things are the result of other people's sin. If the person you're dating cheats on you, if your spouse is abusive, if your son or daughter makes self-destructive choices, you suffer because of someone else's sin in your life. If a drunk driver hits you, hits someone you love, injures someone, kills someone, you suffer because of someone else's sin. It really isn't fair to God if I pick up a gun and if I choose to shoot someone with it and then say, why did God allow that bad thing to happen? Some bad things are the results of Satan's attacks. Satan has limited power in this world, but this world is his domain. And the Bible tells us that the devil has come to steal, to kill, and destroy. We read in the Old Testament about Job, who suffered all kinds of affliction at, at once. He, he, he suffered the tragic death of his children, he, 10 children, uh, uh, a bankruptcy. He experienced physical sores all over his body and was in misery. And it wasn't because he sinned, and it wasn't even because other people sinned, and it wasn't because God was doing it, but God was allowing Satan to attack him. It was Satan's attack. God didn't cause that to happen to Job. So here's some of the reasons bad things happen. But listen, most bad things happen in our lives because we live in a fallen world. That's why most of it happens. Genesis chapter 3, verse 18 teaches that because of Adam and Eve's sin, nature was corrupted. Thorns and thistles entered the world. And when Adam and Eve used their free will, their free choice to introduce sin into this perfect world that God had made, it put everything out of kilter. And ever since, the world has been out of sync with droughts and floods and famines and wars and violence and terrorism and hurricanes and tornadoes and fires and viruses and illnesses. The air is polluted. The water is contaminated. The ground is poisoned because we live in a fallen world where the Bible says because of that rain falls on the just and the unjust. That means the same knife that will cut bread can also be used to murder someone with evil. Cancer will strike believers and non-believers. The force of gravity that keeps me on the earth can also cause me to fall and break my leg. Friends, let's get it clear in our mind. God doesn't cause bad things. You say, why didn't he create a perfect world? At the beginning, he did. There was no tragedy. There was no suffering. There was no pain. But he also created a world with free choice that led to sin and destruction and suffering. You say, well, why would God give us free choice then? Why would God give us free will? Because God is love. And love has to involve the choice. Love has to involve free will. I've always said, I don't want my wife Barbara to love me because God computer programmed her to love me and she had no choice in the matter. I want her to love me because out of the three and a half billion guys on the planet that she could have chosen from, she chose me. 
She said, I choose the guy with the funny voice. I choose the guy that's going to make my last name a fruit for the rest of my life. It's meaningful to me because she had the freedom not to choose me, but she chose me. Maybe you've wondered, well, well, couldn't God have seen what was going to happen? And the people would rebel and the pain and suffering, that evil that would be a part of our lives. So, so if he could see that, why would he go ahead and create the world? And I think partially it's for the reason that many of us parents decided to have children. Didn't those of us who had children or adopted children into our families? Didn't we know that they could experience some pain and some tragedy and suffering in their life? Didn't they? Didn't we know that they could grow up to turn their back on us? That they could grow up to make some unwise choices? That they could hurt us deeply? Of course we did. So why did we go ahead and have children? Because we knew there was also the possibility of great love and great joy, the potential for deep and meaningful relationships. And the same is true with God. God knew sin would mar the world, but he also knew that many people would choose to love him with their free choice and love others and would choose to spend eternity with him forever. And for him, the possibility that you would respond to his love by loving him back, even though it meant the suffering and the pain and evil associated with the death of his only son, to him, it was worth it. So if you or someone you love is going through a bad season right now, there's several things I want you to remember. First, I want you to remember that you are not alone. Have you ever seen somebody go through something really horrible in their life and you think, I could never handle that. I could never deal with that. I've watched people lose children and I don't think it can get any worse than that. I, I could endure, I, I would take on all the pain in the world to keep my kids from hurting. I've watched friends of mine whose wives have gotten cancer and I think I would be absolutely inconsolable if Barbara got cancer. And yet I've done funerals for people who've lost children and buried spouses from cancer. And I'm amazed at their strength. In fact, I could tell you story after story of Jesus' follower in this church who found strength when they needed it. When they didn't think they could take another step, when they needed it the most, God was with them. Why? Because God says in Isaiah 43, verse two, when you go through deep waters, I will be, say it, with you. When you pass through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. When you walk through the fire, you will not be burned up. It will not consume you. I'm with you. God says in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 5, I will never leave you. I will never abandon you. So remember, when you're standing at the casket of someone that you loved very much, God is standing with you. When you're sitting in a waiting room and you're getting the worst news imaginable, remember, God is sitting with you. He will never leave you. He goes with you through the deep waters, through the fires, and you are not alone. Second, remember this, pain can serve a purpose. When I was in college, I went to a school called Lincoln Christian University uh, back in Illinois, and I'm studying for ministry. And uh, two of our professors were married to each other, Dr. Wayne and Janet Shaw. And while I was in school, uh, Janet gave birth to a baby that had Down syndrome. And I remember shortly after the birth of their child, there was a group of faculty and staff that gathered together to pray for the Shaws. And I remember the prayers as they were going around the circle. There were, there were people praying, oh God, we don't understand why this terrible tragedy has happened for the Shaw family. Oh God, be with them through this challenging and difficult time. There were all these prayers, you know, about how horrible this experience was. 
And then it was time for Dr. Bruce Shields to pray. Dr. Bruce Shields and his wife, Rosemary, had a teenage son, Jimmy, that had Down syndrome. And I'll never forget his prayer. He said, oh God, thank you for the joy that can now come into this home that they would have never known in any other way. And I thought, there's a guy who gets it. The pain can serve a purpose. There are many at Eastside right now who would look back and would say it was through a season of pain that they were drawn back into a relationship with God. In fact, the Apostle Paul talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10. He says, for God can use sorrow in our lives to help us turn away from sin and seek salvation. And we will never regret that kind of sorrow. That's a pretty radical thought, isn't it? That we would never regret that sorrow that comes our way in life. Why? Because if it causes us to seek God, if it causes us to turn in his direction, if it causes us to find amazing grace through Jesus Christ, if it causes us to change our address for eternity, the value of that experience is so great that it's worth whatever pain we experienced in the first place. There's one final thing I'm going to ask you to remember. Remember that pain won't last forever. You know, during his lifetime of following Jesus, the Apostle Paul experienced beatings where he was left for dead, shipwrecks, disease, prison, hunger, thirst, homelessness, all in an attempt to follow Jesus. And yet he wrote these words in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 7. He said, for our, notice how he describes all of that, our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Paul says, while the suffering is intense on earth for a few years, and he doesn't deny that. He's not, you know, Pollyanna about that. He says that pales in comparison with the thousands and the millions and the billions of years in heaven with no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more mourning, no more death, no more crying, no more bloated stomachs, no more mass shootings, no more tear-stained divorce papers, no more sexual harassment, no more tables for one, no more motionless ultrasounds, no more tiny caskets. Our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far out outweighs them all. And when you're in a season of suffering, you're not alone. Pain can have a purpose, and it won't last forever. Okay, you ready for our final question? Need to take a moment, just kind of relax, kind of stretch, breathe in, breathe out, <laughs> kind of because it's another big one, okay? So let's get ready to dive in. Here's the last question. What happens to those who never hear about Jesus? What happens to those who never hear about Jesus? And I understand why this would be on the minds of so many people, because there's an unspoken implication to this question. In fact, as I was thinking about it, I think there's a question behind the question. And since we're not afraid to ask any questions in this series, and we'll put them all out there, let's ask the question that I think is really behind the question. Here's the question that I think is behind it. Do people who never hear about Jesus go to hell simply because they were never given the opportunity to hear about Jesus? Because if that's the case, in many of our minds, that violates a fundamental sense of fairness. It seems to paint a picture of God that he is capricious and unloving and fundamentally unjust. You see, there's a widely held assumption in our culture today throughout our world. You've heard it. Maybe you've said this. Maybe some of you believe this. And it, the widely held assumption is that basically all religions are the same. Ever hear that? Ever ever? ever said that? Maybe you know somebody who believes that. Basically, all religions are the same. And the idea is, you know, like, like, like say you were traveling to Chicago. Somebody say, you know, there's many ways to get to Chicago. You can fly. You can take the bus. You can uh, take the train. You know, you can hire an Uber driver, you know, thousands of miles. What, what, there are many ways to get to Chicago. There are many paths, but all paths eventually lead to the same place. 
And so spiritually, some people take that the same way to say, whether your path to God is Christianity or Buddhism or Islam or Hinduism or Judaism or New Age kinds of beliefs, all spiritual paths lead to the same place. They all lead to God. Thus, all religions are the same. But friends, if you do just a little bit of homework, you don't have to look very deep to conclude that all religions are not the same. For instance, Hinduism says everything is God. It says, uh, you know, this podium right here is God. The chair you're sitting in is God. The building that we're in is God. You're God, I'm God, you know, everywhere a God, God kind of thing. Islam denies that Jesus was God. Buddha was noncommittal about the idea even of God. He wasn't sure there was a God. He was kind of an agnostic. Christianity says there is one God existing in three persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Now, here's the reality. We can casually say, you know, well, basically all religions are the same and, and all paths lead to God, but Christianity is unique from every other religion in the world. And the biggest difference is in terms of how you get reconciled to God. I've discovered in my studies, you can sum up every other religion in the world with a simple two-letter word, and that is D-O. It's based on what you do. All other religions are basically based on the idea of people doing something in order to strive to earn their way to be accepted by God. You gotta use a Tibetan prayer wheel, or you've gotta go on a pilgrimage to Mecca, or give alms to the poor, or avoid eating certain foods, or knock on enough doors, or go through enough reincarnations. Every other religion in the world is based on something you've got to do in order to be acceptable to God. The problem with that is you never know if you're doing enough. You never know if you're acceptable. But Jesus comes along in Christianity and says, you don't have to do anything to earn your way to God. Christianity is spelled D-O-N-E. It's done. It's done. In Christianity, you put your trust in Jesus Christ and what he's done on a cross. When Jesus died on the cross, just before you know, his last breath, he said, it is done, it is finished. I have paid for the sins of the world. And all we have to do is trust in the payment that has already been done by Jesus Christ, receive it and earn it instead of earning it. Here's the major difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world. Familiar verses, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this not from yourselves. Notice it's a gift. It's the gift of God. Not by works. Not by anything that you do so that no one can boast because it's done. You see, religion is our attempt to reach God. Jesus Christ and Christianity is God's attempt to reach us. And there's a big difference. There's nothing like it in the world. And so this is why Jesus said this statement that drives some people crazy. John 14, verse 6, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And a lot of people think those are some of the most bigoted, snobbish, narrow-minded, outrageous words to roll off of anyone's lips in the history of the world. And maybe that's been a roadblock for some of you to come to faith in Jesus Christ. But I've come to the conclusion that when Jesus made that statement, that he was making a statement not of great arrogance, but of tremendous compassion and love. Because if those words are true, that sentence is the single greatest piece of information you can ever gain in the course of your lifetime. If Jesus' words are true, it would have been the most unloving, uncompassionate thing in the world, even hateful thing, not to share that with us. So what happens to those who never hear about Jesus? Do they go to hell because they've never had the opportunity to hear about him? Well, first, Jesus addressed this issue when he made this promise in Matthew chapter 7, beginning in verse 7. Jesus said, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. 
knock, and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks will find, and the one who knocks, the door will be open. Notice anyone anywhere who keeps asking, who keeps seeking, who keeps knocking, who keeps praying will be led by God to the place where they will find, and Jesus says the door will be open. In Acts chapter 10, we find a a guy by the name of Cornelius. He was a Roman soldier, a centurion. He was not a believer in God. He, he uh, uh, was not a part of the Jewish faith, which all the followers of Jesus had been up to that point. But he just started praying, God, if you're there, reveal yourself to me. I want to know who you are if you're there. And so God miraculously directs a guy named Peter, a Jew who had followed Jesus to his door. And Peter sits down with Cornelius and his family and explains to them about what Jesus has done on a cross for them. And every one of them came to faith. Every one of them were baptized, the first Gentile followers of Jesus in history. And today we see the same thing happening in mysterious and unexpected ways. For example... Many Muslims around the world today who seemed unreachable for 13 centuries. We went by 13 centuries and there was very few uh, Muslims who became followers of Jesus. But today, many are having dreams and visions of Jesus. Great numbers of them are coming to faith. In the last 15 years, 7 million Muslims a year have become followers of Jesus Christ. There are numerous accounts of people in Muslim and Hindu countries in remote areas who cry out to God and say, God, if I want to know you if you're there. And in amazing sets of circumstances, God brings a Christian, a book, a CD, a Bible, because the Bible promises those who diligently seek will find. Second, I think it's important to remember that while everyone in the world may not have equal amounts of access to information about Jesus... They are responsible to follow whatever measure of information God has given to them. It might just be seeing God through observing his amazing works in nature. Because God made it possible for all people to know that he exists by what he's made. You say, how? Romans chapter 1 talks about that, beginning in verse 19. For the truth about God is known to them instinctively. We know the, the, the truth about God. God has put this knowledge in their hearts. From the time the world was created, people have seen the earth and the sky and all that God made. They can clearly see his invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature. And so they have no excuse whatsoever for not knowing God. Every person has enough information from the incredible design and order of creation to know that God exists. When a person in any part of the world sees a sunrise or a sunset or a mountain peak or a newborn baby... If we're honest, not religious, if we're just honest, you have to believe there's a creator, there's an intelligent designer behind the design. There's a famous story about the late Helen Keller who was born blind and deaf and unable to speak. And when Annie Sullivan taught her sign language with her hands, she taught her the word God. And when she did, Helen Keller responded, That's his name? I always knew he was there. I just didn't know his name. So if people will seek out the God who has clearly revealed himself through the world he has made, that God, according to the Bible, will go out of his way to meet them and lead them into his fuller truths as well as salvation. Here's another thought that flows out of this last one. If you're kind of scrutinizing the Christian faith, I want you to know God is a fair judge. God is fair. In other words, God's not ever going to judge anyone unfairly, but he will judge them according to the amount of light, according to the amount of information that they had. Jesus taught in Luke chapter 12, verses 47 and 48, that a servant who knows what his master wants and doesn't do it will be punished severely. But the one who doesn't know what his master wants and does something wrong will be punished only lightly. Jesus often told people that there will be greater judgment for those who heard and rejected him 
than those who had a lesser knowledge of God. So no one's ever gonna be able to shake their fist at God one day and say, you're just not fair. But listen, because I want you to be very careful to understand that everyone who has spiritual life has a degree of responsibility before God about what they do with that light. And everybody's got some light. Whether it's information about Jesus, whether it's about how God has revealed himself through his creation, and therefore, every person still needs to hear and respond to the message of Jesus. And this is why we are passionate about our mission at Eastside. We're not just going through motions around here. We care about our world locally and globally. And we believe what we're doing here matters now and for eternity. And we want everybody on planet Earth to hear the name of Jesus. Now, before I close, there's one last thing I wanna say. The person who asked, what about those who've never heard about Jesus? I want you to think about this. That person has without exception heard about Jesus. And let me just gently, just kind of lovingly as a friend remind you today, based on what we've discussed, you have the information. You've heard about Jesus. And you have the opportunity. Right now you have the opportunity so you are more responsible for what you do with this than the person in the remote part of the world you might be asking about. So could I ask you, what would stop you today from receiving the grace of Jesus in your life? There's nothing you have to do. It's not by works. It's done. It's D-O-N-E. It's receiving the payment that has already been made for you that's already done. Why should you follow Jesus as the way, the truth, and the life? Because Jesus is God. John 1 says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And because Jesus is the creator, Colossians 1, for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. Because Jesus is the giver of life, and him was life, and that life was the light of men. And because Jesus conquered death, just as Christ, Romans 6, 4, was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too may live a new life. And because Jesus is the way to eternal life, John three fifteen, everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. And because Jesus loves me, for God so loved the world, that means me, that means you, that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. Amen. He is the King of kings, and he is the Lord of lords. He is the conqueror of death. He is the giver of life, and he wants to be your life today. Let's bow our heads together. So how about it? Any takers on Jesus' invitation to your life today? Are there any of you here right now who realize you've heard you're responsible who want to say, that's what I want to do. I want to put my faith in Jesus Christ, the Son of God, to be my forgiver, my leader, my guide, the only way. Just tell him right now with simple childlike faith, just silently pray, say, Jesus, I ask you to be my leader, my, my guide, my forgiver, my king today. I give my life to you. Forgive my sin through what you have done on a cross. Bible says you ought to confess your faith. You ought to take it public. And so I want to invite you to do a very courageous thing. I want to invite you, if you're putting your faith in Jesus today, to confess it to me. Jesus said, if you confess me before others, I will confess you before the Father. While everybody else has their heads bowed and their eyes closed, if you're making this decision today, just boldly and courageously, would you just put your hand in the air and just say, today, Gene. I've said yes to Jesus, wherever you are in the room. Good for you. God bless you. Yeah, see those, keep those hands up. Or just anybody else, good for you. Great. 
Congratulations for all of you who are making that decision. If you made that decision, let me encourage you to go a step further. The first thing a repentant, sincere, believing person did in the New Testament when they came to follow Jesus is they were baptized, symbolizing that there was a death and a burial and a resurrection taking place in their life. And we can make arrangements for that in any campus. Just fill out your connection card. Let us know you've decided to follow Jesus. You're interested in baptism. Give it to somebody at Information or Guest Central on your way out today. And our team will be in touch with you. We'll celebrate with you. Father in heaven, I have the sense today that this moment is a real turning point, a forever turning point for people in this room. You saw those people who just humbly and courageously admitted what the majority of humanity cannot and will not admit, that they've been on the wrong path and that they want to follow the way, the truth, and the life, and they want to come to you. And I thank you for those who just said yes to Jesus today. Thank you for the courage it takes in a public setting to say, I want through what Jesus has done on a cross for me to enter the kingdom of heaven and live my life with purpose and destiny. And it's done, it's done, it's done. And God, thank you that you didn't respond to our pain and suffering in this world just by sending us a card or a lot of words. But you responded with a visit. You entered into our pain. And God, for those among us today who are in a season of pain, be their comfort, be their strength. May they cling to the promise that one day their pain will be over and you have prepared a place for us beyond description. Until that, may we hold on to you and never let go knowing that you are right here by our side. You are with us. And we thank you in Jesus' name and for his sake. And everybody said? Hey, can we get a little crazy and celebrate with those who said yes to Jesus today? Everything changed. Everything changed for them today. Please let us know with your connection cards. Next week, This Is Us kicks off. Great series to invite. And don't forget, Changemaker Celebration this Wednesday night. Look forward to being with all you changemakers. Love all of you. Have a great week. God bless you.